All right. Uh, this is a book that I published in uh, 2007. As I told you, I would really like to be able to give it all to you for free, but uh, it's, a, it's still a national bestseller. <clears throat> And you'll have to uh, get it through some book dealer. But if you want the basic information for free, it's in my 2002 newsletters. So uh, not with the humor, enjoyment that this book is written, but um, it, but in, uh, in the form of uh, the information and the scientific references, what we talk about over the next few weeks, you'll be able to easily find in my 2002 newsletters. So... The first thing I want you to know, and I do need to go to the back of the book to do this, I think, is uh, it doesn't show a good picture of him. But uh, there is a great picture that I'd love to have shown you of this man right here. Uh, name, his name is Howard Bartner. <coughs> Howard Bartner. And uh, he, uh, he was uh, the head medical illustrator of the National Institutes of Health. Uh, I met him on, online. He emailed me. So it was uh, more than, uh, well, many more than 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago. He had a uh, medical illustrator of the National Institute of Health, so he worked with doctors all the time. And Howard got into trouble himself, and he emailed me, and he asked for help. And I got him out of trouble. Uh, we don't need to go into the details, but he wasn't even a patient. And like with many of you, you've written me. I've given you information enough information for you to take uh, another approach. <clears throat> so I did this uh, for uh, Mr. Bartner, extremely talented man. He did all the illustrations for this particular book. How that came about was in the 2001, uh, Mary and I and Howard and Elaine, we went on a trip, uh, one of our McDougal adventure trips to the inner passages of Alaska. And we we're on a small boat, uh, about an 80 passenger boat and they had, uh, <clears throat> they had no slide projector. <laughs> so uh, as a result, I had to convey my message without any slides. And that meant I had to do drawings. And my writing uh, talent is, uh, well, I'll just say I would starve to death if I had to make my living drawing illustrations like uh, Mr. Bartner has done his whole life. Well, he was in the audience very frustrated with what I was doing. And uh, as a result, he uh, volunteered to help me express myself, to better communicate. And so um, after a little discussion, he uh, was uh, willing and able to uh, draw all the illustrations that are in this book. And uh, I can't give enough praise to Howard Bartner. Well, anyway, we were going to talk about chapter four. And chapter four is about uh, gastrointestinal reflux disease, pretty much. It's about GERD, which affects a good share of our population. How do I know this? Well, I go to the drugstore, the grocery store. And for sale in the U.S. Uh, are uh, medications for GERD. They're called proton pump inhibitors. Uh, they are effective, but they are toxic. And uh, they are sold over the counter in the U.S., maybe some other parts of the world, because uh, indigestion is so common. That means uh, pain in the stomach is so common and reflux is so common, it's uh, an everyday occurrence for most people. So here's the chapter. Uh, my stomach's on fire and I can't put it out. It's chapter four. Well, the reason people's uh, stomachs are in trouble, it's going to be a big step for you. So, you know, don't get too shocked when I tell you this. The reason people's stomachs are in trouble is because of the food they put in their stomach. But uh, there's some short-term and long-term effects on the stomach uh, from putting the wrong things in. Those of you who are longtime listeners, you know what the right thing to put in the stomach is, and that's starch. Potatoes, sweet potatoes, corn, rice, some beans, peas, and lentils, a little fruit, some non-starchy vegetable stuff like kale or broccoli. Uh, that's what you put in your stomach to make it healthy. <clears throat> well, people, uh, what they do is they uh, swallow the food not just three times a day, but maybe 14 times a day. They swallow the food. And uh, if you'll notice this picture here, this is a picture of a stomach. And one of our characters, our characters are uh, Larry and Louise. And you can read about uh, see uh, read about them, see pictures of them. But here's a picture of the stomach. And you see what would be on, boy, oh boy, this side. <laughs> this side right here, this stomach. 
This stomach, its lower esophageal sphincter is open. This stomach, the lower esophageal sphincter is closed. That's the way it's supposed to be, it's closed right there. And when you swallow, what happens is this sphincter opens up and the food goes into the stomach. Between meals, the sphincter is supposed to be closed. So the stomach contents can't reflux up into the esophagus. But when you eat the Western diet, you destroy the physical competence of the sphincter. And we'll get to that later in our discussion, how that happens. But I'll give you the bottom line. It's from chronic straining, from chronic constipation. It, it ends up destroying the support for the sphincter. And if, if you read ahead in the book, you'll see how. And now what happens is uh, the stomach contents can constantly reflux up into the esophagus. You see that? And that's what GERD is, gastroesophageal reflux disease. And it burns the lower part of the esophagus, causing esophagitis. And when it burns it really bad, we call it Barrett's esophagitis. And then as it burns further and longer, uh, in some cases, it turns into adenocarcinoma of the esophagus, which is essentially, you know, it's a very bad disease. And it's essentially untreatable in terms of cure. You can go in and take out uh, the tumor, uh, rearrange the uh, esophagus and uh, stomach and intestines, and you can do some good. This is a... This is a what do they say? What do our uh, national leaders say? Uh, this is a real bad thing <laughs> to have a have a deal. Uh, anyway, uh, it's a mechanical change. Uh, you can't fix it except by mechanical means, which would be a surgeon going in and pulling the sphincter uh, back down in its proper position, uh, supported by the diaphragm and kind of sewing it back down there. You don't want to do that because you can relieve the, uh, the GERD, the reflux, by putting good things in the stomach. Uh, what causes uh, acid and acid irritation is eating uh, animal foods, primarily animal proteins, dairy proteins. Yes, dairy proteins cause a lot of acid secretion. And other things like drinking coffee and decaf coffee causes a tremendous amount of acid production, which then refluxes up into your esophagus. So uh, you want to put good things in your stomach, and uh, then the, the reflux won't bother you in most cases uh, just by putting good contents in there. And then the other thing I have people do is I have them raise the head of their bed. Because of gravity, if you raise the head of your bed, you can see here that gravity will pull the contents of the stomach uh, out of the esophagus and back into the stomach if you just raise the head of your bed by about four inches. And you can do this with a, a brick or a four by four or whatever, about four inches, you raise it. And so gravity pulls the uh, acid uh, out of the esophagus, keeps it in the stomach. And this is good. So you eat good things. You get a little gravity working for you. Uh, you can also take antacids. And uh, the antacids I prefer would be wafers or liquids, like Tums is uh, an example. You know, whatever brand of antacid you want. And then if that doesn't solve it, then I go on to H2 blockers, uh, which are anti-acid pills, which are, you know, they're not safe, but uh, they're better than the next category, which are proton pump inhibitors. And proton pump inhibitors are very dangerous. I almost never prescribe them. It's a very last result. Uh, there's just an article, unfortunately, my water glass got on it, but you can you can look that up. It's open access. Uh, it came out December 2016 in Kidney International, Kidney International. And uh, you can look it up under Kidney International. You could just look up the uh, article title under Google. Let's see if I can give it to you right there. See that? Sorry about the loss of the corner. Okay, what it, what it says here is that uh, these proton pump inhibitors uh, result in kidney in injury, kidney injury. Uh, they also cause osteoporosis. Uh, they also increase your risk of having lung infections, uh, all kinds of things. You could go on forever in terms of the side effects of these things like Pravisic and Prilosec and Nexium and so on. These are proton pump inhibitors. <clears throat> you, you, you don't want to go there if you don't have to. So if you have indigestion or you have uh, GERD, reflux, then you want to put good food in, which is starch, fruits and vegetables. I do have to add one caveat, very important, is that raw vegetables, raw vegetables, uh, particularly onions, 
particularly raw onions, uh, green, green peppers, cucumbers, and radishes. Uh, they will cause a lot of indigestion in people. I mean, these are healthy foods, but they cause horrible indigestion. Now, cooked, they're well tolerated. If you come to our 10-day program, when we serve burgers, usually on Wednesday, Jeff Novick makes a burger and Mary makes a burger, without blood vessels, by the way. We make burgers. And uh, as part of the, uh, the toppings, the condiments, we have cooked onions, and they really go well with the burgers. So you want to be careful about raw food if you have indigestion. Cooked food is so much better tolerated. <clears throat> well, all right. So you've got this reflux condition. You're going to solve it for now by eating well, raising the head of your bed, and using, say, uh, wafer antacids like Tums as needed. It may, you may go to uh, antacids such as uh, <clears throat> H2 blockers as a next result. You take them as needed. Of course, you discuss it all with your healthcare provider. And you use proton pump inhibitors as a very last resort because they're so dangerous. Now, when you get the reflux, let me tell you uh, uh, this picture right here in the book. Let me hold it up for you. Uh, all right, a little closer, I think you can get it. Uh, this, uh, this is a picture. You see the stomach. You see the esophagus. What I'm trying to show you here is reflux of the esophagus, it burns the lower esophagus, esophagus, causing esophagitis, and the reflux continues and the stomach contents go up uh, into the area of the vocal cords where it crosses chronic cough and laryngitis. You see the vocal cords up there uh, by the chin. And then the reflux goes further up into the sinuses, causes sinusitis, gets on your teeth, takes the enamel off your teeth, the acid does from your stomach, and then you inhale the acid contents of the stomach and it burns the airways, the bronchial tubes, and you get bronchitis and asthma and emphysema eventually and all kinds of terrible things. So this acid reflux is a, uh, is a big deal. And uh, <clears throat> the way you got the reflux in the first place, we'll discuss later on. And uh, the way you get, got this reflux is you destroyed this lower esophageal sphincter by chronic straining, uh, secondary to constipation, but it's a mechanical problem. You can't fix it except by mechanical means, which is surgery, and you really don't want to do that unless there's no other choice. So, Gustavo, I'm assuming we're still in contact. I'd like to turn the stage back over to you, if we could. That when you're talking about food, you are uh, talking about also not ingesting anything like oil. And any other oh yeah, yeah. Fats. of course we've, we've done many uh, topics on this right is, uh, fatty food you know, I, I showed you the mechanical change that occurs by uh, repositioning the lower esophageal sphincter from the abdomen supported by the diaphragm up into the chest that's for through many years of constipation uh, straining but you also have short-term effects on the lower esophageal sphincter which relaxes that sphincter and uh, causes you to have GERD. And the, uh, the short-term effects are primarily caused by eating fat. Uh, and then you get reflux from, you know, fats, any kind of fats and oils. Uh, there are other things that cause it. There are various medications that re re uh, relax that sphincter. Uh, <clears throat> uh, chocolate relaxes the sphincter. Yeah, so. Um, All right. Good. Yeah, that's what I, I'm talking about in terms of that sphincter. And, you know, maybe I should just go for, just for one more statement about the coffee and decaf because it's yes. good for people. Yes. Uh, and, and the research, by the way, all the research, what I'm talking about is found on the website for free. 2002 newsletters would be a good source. Or you can just put coffee or decaf in the search engine. You'll find the uh, scientific references. But uh, coffee has alkaloids in it. I'm not talking about the caffeine. It has alkaloids in it that cause acid secretion, a tremendous amount of acid secretion. Uh, and if you take the caffeine out and you make decaf coffee, you get as much secretion of acid because it's not the caffeine, it's the alkaloids, uh, the other chemicals that are in the uh, coffee bean. So some people, they will switch to decaf because of the jitteriness caused by caffeine. 
and they'll go to decaf and they'll say, my stomach hurts just as badly. Well, that's because it's not the caffeine that causes uh, the acid production and the indigestion. Any serious coffee drinker yeah, carries around a, you know, a pack of antacids to relieve the indigestion. It's almost universal. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is the uh, uh, timely recommendations to drink milk for ulcers. Uh, this is uh, untrue. Uh, milk actually makes acid secretion worse because of the milk protein and the calcium in the milk. So you're just going to increase acid secretion. You are never going to heal ulcers. Uh, we used to try this when I was a, a young student. This dates back almost 50 years ago. We would feed people milk to cure their ulcers. And uh, scientific studies showed that it never worked. And then we'd feed them a special diet called the SIPPY diet, S-I-P-P-Y diet, which was uh, an acid, you know, like, like Maalox or Tums or liquid antacid. We give them, people with ulcers and terrible indigestion, we give them a dose of that. And then we give them a dose of half and half the next hour. That's, that's milk, you know, half and half. And what they found with follow-up with these people, first of all, they had uh, no improvement of ulcer healing compared to being on no regime at all. And second of all, two studies done, uh, one in Britain, one in the U.S., showed on follow-up that they had two to six times as much risk of dying of heart disease <laughs> because of the, uh, the dairy part of the sippy diet. So uh, you don't want to fall into that, uh, that nonsense, which has been proven this proven to be nonsense for at least 40 years. Uh, uh, you know, you, you don't want to heal ulcers that way. And then we'll get into that more next week. Maybe we'll get a chance to talk about actual stomach ulcers <laughs> right. and bacterial infection. So, so those to, are just a couple. <clears throat> okay. Um, Dr. McDougall, how about uh, tea? Uh, you're, uh, since tea wouldn't have the chemicals, maybe, that you're referring to in coffee, would it uh, be okay to drink tea even if it's caffeinated? I, I find most people tolerate tea well, and you know most of us like to get high too. So <laughs> consuming consuming substances that make us high, that's uh, like right. Caffeine is fun, and uh, most people can get away with black tea as far as uh, effects on the cardiovascular system. Uh, coffee raises cholesterol, right? Yes, it does right. and triglycerides. Yes. A decaf coffee does the same and maybe even worse. Mm -hmm. uh, black tea, uh, I find. Uh, uh, in my clinical experience, uh, personally, as well as my read of the scientific literature, black tea is well tolerated. You still get a little buzz, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it has no effects in terms of cardiovascular, adverse cardiovascular disease. But some people are sensitive to right. teas, too. And if it bothers you, you know, if you drink it or eat it and it hurts, listen. You know, do something about it. Don't do it. Listen to your body. Right. But, but herbal tea would be fine, then. Well, it depends. Again, right. uh, herbal teas can mean lots of things. Yeah. There's a cannabis herbal tea. <laughs> That's <laughs> you know, right. That's but, right. Uh, you know, herbal tea doesn't mean a lot to me. Uh, in general, I found uh, most things uh, promoted as herbal teas for health benefits have been uh, lackluster. I haven't seen uh, any great improvements in people's health by switching to herbal teas. Uh, it's not the problem. The problem is food poisoning from animals and oils. Uh, right. So yeah, herbal tea will probably work out for you, but uh, you're the, you're the ultimate gauge of that in deciding. Does it hurt? <clears throat> right, right. Doctor McDougall, a question from one of our viewers here. My doctor put me on Prevacid 17 years ago, and I have been taking 30 milligrams a day ever since. How do I safely and effectively get off of this medication? Okay, well, you, of course, you're going to talk to your doctor because I'm not your doctor. Right. Uh, but, but we're going to face more than 40 people tomorrow at uh, the McDougall Clinic in Santa Rosa. And probably 10%, I'm just guessing, probably 10% are on these proton pump inhibitors. And what they will be told the first day by myself and Dr. Lim is to stop, stop these medications. Now, there are some exceptions. Uh, there are few, but we'll just stop them, plain, simple, stop them. And uh, then the recommendation along with that will be to avoid raw vegetables and also fruit juice. I have to tell you, fruit juice is very disturbing, like orange yes. juice, or grapefruit right. juice, not the orange or the grapefruit, 
but the juice mm -hmm. is very distressing to the stomach. We don't serve juices in our program except for prune juice, which is for another reason. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, they will be told, uh, let's just say I told you 10%, 40 people, four people, that's probably too low. But maybe eight people will be told uh, tomorrow, Saturday, and Sunday to stop taking their proton pump inhibitors. Boom, stop them. And they will. And uh, they'll be told to avoid the raw vegetables and fruit juices. They will be told to eat a starch-based diet. They'll be told to be careful about uh, spices like sriracha sauce and our salsas. But they don't usually bother people, but they could. And uh, then what they will be told if the, uh, oh, we'll also raise the head of the bed. We do this at the clinic. So this is standard practice for uh, the resort to go in and put uh, four-inch blocks. We have them all made under the head of your bed. <clears throat> And uh, then what uh, Dr. Lim and I will tell people is, look, if you have some indigestion, uh, go across the street to the pharmacy, which is about two, 300 feet from our, uh, our clinic, and pick up some Tums or other wafer or liquid mm -hmm. antacids. And use that as needed. If that doesn't work, pick up some H2 blockers like Zantac and take those as needed and all along the way, we'll be in contact with these people. Uh, Dr. Lim and I will be to know how they're doing, but almost never do they have to restart the proton pump inhibitors. So I say almost never. But let's just guess that, uh, I don't know. Let's just guess out of 50 people I, I asked to stop them, maybe one or two has to restart them because it's the only way they find relief. Right. So I just right. have my patients stop them. Why not? Uh, these yeah. things are toxic. Right? Uh, you know, I just showed you they cause kidney disease. You can look at this again. It's open access. You can read about it. But they cause osteoporosis. Um, and we'll get into that in the next lecture. I'll show you how they cause osteoporosis, how they destroy your bones, increase your risk of hip fractures. Uh, the reason they give you more infections in the lungs is because you don't have the acid in the stomach to kill the bacteria uh, that reflux up into your lungs and give you a pneumonia that could kill you <clears throat> right. anyway. Right. Uh, one sad thing for me to read here was that chocolate and even worse, dark chocolate <laughs> is even worse. Uh, so is it because of some of the uh, alkaloids? Alkaloids. Present? Yeah. Yeah. You know what? And if, if, that, that, if that's, that's <laughs> the thing that's keeping you from eating a diet of potatoes, rice, corn, etc., then Put chocolate on your dessert list. We actually That's serve right. Yeah, we serve chocolate <laughs> twice at the clinic. You do, yes. Uh, yeah, we do. Tomorrow night, I believe we have chocolate brownies, or it could be chocolate pudding. And at the end and of the, the program, I said, we, yeah, we have, we have a chocolate pudding. And you were in uh, Hawaii. I'm sure they served a few chocolate desserts there. Oh, yeah, they did. Um, oh, those desserts in Hawaii were just amazing. Right? Wow. Yeah, a, little people did not, <laughs> a few people didn't understand they were desserts. They thought they were main course. I know. Yes, it's not easy to not make them the first course. Uh, Dr. McDougall, since one, of, since one of the symptoms of really bad, uh, you know, uh, GERD disease is, is that it's... Uh, it may seem like a heart attack. How can a person tell if they're not, if they're having a heart attack and as opposed to? Well, it, it's very difficult. Um, so it is because, difficult. Yeah, it is difficult because the pain that uh, is created by um, the esophagus is very similar to the pain that you get when you have dying heart muscle. Uh, there are some distinctions. Um, I don't think I've ever been confused myself personally. I, I find very rarely our patients confused. But when you're having a heart attack, uh, you're in big distress. Uh, you feel like uh, they tell me that you feel like an elephant is sitting on your chest. Yes. Most people know they're in big trouble. Now, there are silent heart attacks, but they're silent. That's just the way it is. You never know about them. <clears throat> if you're having a distress to the point where you psychologically, emotionally, or those around you realize that there's something big going on, you must avail yourself to uh, medical care ASAP. And uh, people suffer from indigestion, uh, at least in my personal and patient experience, uh, they know it's indigestion. Uh, the distress right. is, uh, is much less, even though the pain may be there, uh, the actual distress that your body's saying, hey, hey, buddy, 
<laughs> got some bad going on here. Something really uh, bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most people, uh, I think, can make the distinction, but it's it hard. Be but when you get to the ER, the emergency room, the doctors and nurses are going to have trouble figuring out the source of the problem, and the differential diagnosis is a heart attack, and you know, carditis, inflammation of the of the heart linings, and esophagitis, mm -hmm. and and uh, you know. Uh, costochondritis, pain in the bones. So there's all kinds of things that are going to be thought about. I say, uh, when your body's in trouble uh, and you experience serious distress, likely it's talking to you clearly. Yeah, yeah, it will be clear. Uh, Dr. McDougall, uh, you mentioned something that I, it was very interesting because so many children have asthma, and you say yeah. here that um, there is a connection Yes. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that. Well, I would love to. And by the way, uh, all physicians know this and should be practicing this. Oh. This is, this is standard, uh, standard uh, discussions in pediatric and hmm. pulmonary conferences that <clears throat> reflux, uh, as I showed you, uh, the refluxed acid is inhaled right. into the bronchi and causes asthma. It's a, it's a leading cause of asthma. Uh, there are other causes like. You know, the air, et cetera. But it's a leading cause of easily controllable asthma to stop the GERD. And uh, the most common cause of GERD in children, in my understanding, is cow's milk, yeah. mm -hmm. dairy products. Uh, they cause uh, horrible indigestion and reflux in children. Uh, that's what the science says in my reading. And the first thing for that reason, and, you know, a thousand others I could give you, if I had time, and I do, and I will, uh, you mm -hmm. should stop cow's milk unless you're feeding a baby calf in your field. You, right. should, you should not feed it to human being children. This is toxic. Uh, this will make them sick. This will make them fat. This will make them constipated. This will cause them GERD. This will cause them severe arthritis and auto, other autoimmune diseases. This is poison to feed a, the milk designed for a calf to a human being. Mm -hmm. And uh, the people who do this should be held accountable. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm, still, yes. I'm, st I'm still trying to be appointed your Surgeon General. <laughs> That's Look right. The changes that have taken place in the last few months. <laughs> Couldn't I be Surgeon General? Couldn't I? Well, well I mean, uh, you are, you know, qualified, way qualified. So we just need to sign <laughs> enough petitions. Well, it depends on whose business and whose. Uh, <laughs> That's whose right. Model. That is if right. Talking about industry, well, because would you, I be fired? Yes, and but, as you mentioned in your book here, I mean, this industry alone, with just two medicines, Prilosec and Prevacid, here they're making seven billion dollars. Yeah, and that was ten, that was more than ten years ago. And that was more than ten years ago. Yeah. And what are they going to make by switching to a plant-based diet? Yeah, and then people, the, you know, it, uh, let's not forget to bring this up because I know a lot of our listeners are thinking this. Um, you know, people have to decide they're not going to uh, eat the tri-tip steak right. or consume the brie, brie cheese. Uh, you know, a lot of people think, and uh, I know they're busy, their lives are busy, they got bills to pay and spouses to deal with, and what they eat is very low on their list of priorities. And so they, they say, we say to ourselves, well, you know, I, I just don't have time. I, I just, I'm, not, I'm not just important enough. I have too many other things to deal with to fix the problem. What I'll do is I'll take Lipitor for my cholesterol. I'll take an antacid for my indigestion. I'll take a blood pressure pill for my blood pressure. I'll take a laxative for my constipation. I'll wash off my stinky, oily skin with soap and, because it's just too hard to change my diet. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I understand, but it, it's never going to work. You're never going to fix the problems until you realize <clears throat> that you must uh, eat potatoes and sweet potatoes and rice and corn. In this day and age, with the Instant Pot, there's almost no excuse or with the frozen rice available or easy to cook potatoes or 
you know, it's it's endless, and how effortless you can make this. Exactly, exactly. You know, Dr. Marcuso, you also mentioned something that a lot of people I know that they drink, and it is fruit juices, and you mentioned something about disturbing the fiber and perhaps other components. Um, when you talk about fruit juice, do you also talk about smoothies? The smoothies would fit. <laughs> yeah, uh, okay. The, 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 the initial thing I want you to think about is you don't improve the nutritional quality of a fruit or vegetable by beating it a thousand times with a steel blade. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I, can, I can go back to research done. I believe the author's name was Heaton. And it was published uh, in, I believe, The Lancet, late 70s, early 80s. I, I can easily find it for you. <clears throat> but what he did is he took people and he measured their insulin levels and their blood sugar levels. Uh, just stuck a tube in their, in their arm so he could constantly draw blood. And uh, he started out by feeding them a whole apple. They measured the rise in blood sugar and the rise in insulin. And insulin went up a little bit and blood sugar went up a little bit. And then it went after eating down a little bit. And then he took the apple and he ground it up. This is with peelings, you know, stems, you know, seeds, everything. Ground it up in a blender and fed it to him as applesauce. What happened is the blood sugar went up about the same amount. The insulin levels went much higher because you disrupted the fiber. And the resulting blood sugars after 90 to 120 minutes went way low compared to the apple. <clears throat> and then his group separated the, uh, the pulp from the applesauce and made just sugar and water, apple juice. And the result was the blood sugar went up about the same amount as the apple and the applesauce. The insulin levels went way higher. And the sugar level, the resulting sugar level after an hour or two was much lower. So you do disrupt the fiber. And uh, you also cause changes that, you know, I would have to read a little bit more about to see if anybody's investigated it. But the experience I've had is uh, some of you, think about who you are, some of you can just think about a grapefruit juice or orange juice. And you get indigestion just thinking about it. And then if you drank it, you feel the terrible burning. Somehow disrupting this uh, uh, fruit and removing the fiber uh, makes the whatever's left extremely irritating for most of us in terms of the stomach and esophagus. Yeah, you, you, you may know this experience. That's one reason we don't serve juices at the program. Right, right. But but in the, in the big scheme of things, it ain't a big deal. Right. We're talking about people out there that are poisoning themselves with pork chops and hot dogs and uh, chunks of cheese. You know, a little juice is probably not the problem. Right. I like it when you say that, Dr. Matugo, because it's so easy for many of us. The more we learn the more we attend to detail and, and we, it's, it is easy to get lost in the detail and, and lose track of the big picture, which is stop eating the animals and the animal products and the processed oils. And so I thank you for saying that. Yeah, it, this is so stupid simple. As we, talk, <laughs> yes. as we talked about in this lecture, well, thank you, Dr. McDougall. That was a great introduction to the book. And I think next week we're going to go back to the beginning and then go chronologically. And, and, well, do uh, we have Dr. Lyle next Actually, week? not next week. A week from, in, in two weeks. Next two week weeks. we have Dr. Lyle, and he's going to give us a, an amazing lecture that I heard about two weeks ago on the perfect personality. So that was a very funny and very fun uh and brilliant, actually, lecture. And I asked him to please present it to to, uh, to all of us. So next week is Dr. Lyle. That's good. Then I'll be back in a couple of weeks. And right. uh, thank, right. thank you all for your patience. Uh, we also have something called an intensive weekend coming up right. in May right. of 2017. And this is uh, the most inexpensive, uh, fastest, most efficient way to have direct contact with our staff and the message uh, presented in person. And we do that in May. But again, as all of you know, everything is free on the website. 
uh, no gimmicks. So yeah, uh, yeah, you know, you can go to your and public I library. To, in, I want to personally invite people to attend, well, any of your programs, but I just want to say that in August, I will be there for the 10 day program that, that you're doing. And um, oh, yes, you will. I remember you well. Yes. And it's going to be a very special time for me. And maybe later I can share why, but I just want to tell people that I'll be there and to just come and join you and me and, and, uh, and get well. We, we run one of these programs every couple of months, and we look forward to you. We're, we're here to help. Yeah. Uh, I know I know this sounds all overwhelming for many of you, your friends and family. Uh, you know, I do understand it, but that's why we run this 10-day program. You know, it's hard to understand algebra and calculus and uh, astronomy, but uh, that's why they have uh, universities and uh, organizations to teach this to you. Well, this is what we do. You know, we're asking you to make some very simple changes, but they're not simple when you've spent a lifetime doing the wrong thing. And you also have to deal with the medical businesses. <clears throat> Believe me, the, uh, the physicians and the pharmaceutical companies, they worked hard and they spent a lot of money getting you hooked on these drugs. Now that's a generalization, but it is true. So to get yourself off the medication, sometimes it's difficult. It, um, is. But, it is. But we're, there, we're here the, to make the tough decisions with you. And as I've mentioned many times, and we've published uh, uh, close to 90% of people reduce or stop their medication. Oh, yeah. Well, you do sick guide. People, sick people take drugs. <laughs> you, you make that your mantra all day long. Sick people take drugs. Sick people That's take right. drugs. I, I don't want to be a sick person. And so I need to get healthy so I don't have to take the drugs. Mm -hmm. You know, exactly. sometimes sometimes there are exceptions, but you get the message. All right, excellent. Well, everybody, make sure you read chapters one through three for next for two weeks from today, and uh, we will see you then. And thank you again, Dr. McGregor, for being thank with you us Gustavo. today. Thank okay. you, folks, for listening, and, and uh, thank you for your patience. <laughs> yeah, it's your patience. Uh, all, all right. right. Bye -bye. Goodbye. Have a great weekend.